got the jelly on my nerve blues, yeah. Whoa, it goes down to my shoes, yeah. I got the jelly on my nerve blues. Um, mama, it's such bad news. And the pain is driving me so insane. I can't even remember my name. And it's 2.57 a.m. Yeah, it is 2.57 a.m. And I'm up for the third time this night. And the valiant has run its course. And I've returned to consciousness with my left leg throbbing. And I can't take opiates like Percocet or Vicodin because they don't do shit for nerve pain and anyway they make me depressed and I'm already depressed enough and the culprit, the culprit is a ruptured disc between my L4, L5 vertebrae to be more exact, an extrusion, a leakage of my disc and the pain it runs through my quad and shin and down my sciatic nerve which runs from my butt to the top of the ankle and is vibrating with the intensity of a of a finger stuck in an electric socket. A marvelous medley of radiculopathy. <laughs> radiculopathy, I mean, that is a ridiculous word. I mean, it connotes a compromised nerve that sends radiating pain to parts of the body the nerve serves. But to me, it sounds like a Charlie Parker tune, like ornithology, crazyology, and anthropology. So why not radiculopathy? Shabba doop and day but, you know, it probably was coined when one doctor asked another doctor who had jelly on his nerve to rate his pain from a scale of 1 to 10, and he said it was beyond numbers. It was just a ridiculous amount of pain, and thus the birth of radiculopathy. And this is nerve pain the mother of all pain. So far from nirvana, I find myself fantasizing about self-mutilation. I mean, Alice for lumbar, my leg feels like a contorted piece of lumber, and suddenly I am conjuring up an hallucinatory image of the greatest lumberjack of them all, Paul Bunyan, yeah. And he stands by my side, axe in hand, and exhorting me to remain still so that he is not too damaged to my more modest member nearby. What a guy! And I thank him for his kindness and generosity, and uh, suddenly I find myself thinking about Monty Python's search for the Holy Grail, the tri chipper knight retort of, just a flesh wound, just a flesh wound, as he loses limb after limb. Yeah, just a flesh wound. So perhaps it is demented, this wish to be dismembered by this mythic figure, but at least the pain will be gone, and I will know that my leg will have been taken by the best of the best, and it will bring a new meaning to the word grim and Grimm's fairy tales. Oh, fuck fairy tales. They are crafted by Basil Bob, a.k.a. the devil, and my body has become a demonic vessel, torturing me, laughing at me. So, it is now three o'clock. And guess what? I still have my leg. And the throbbing, pulsating, dendritic devastation seems turned up a notch, the utter ridiculopathy of it all. And suddenly, there is an image before me of my MRI and the doctor's screen. Perfect picture. Contrast is divine. A work of art. Yeah, yeah, I can really see the jelly leisurely lathered across the nerve like mustard at a ballpark frank. This work of art. It belongs in MoMA, this picture of my leaky disc, so magnificently imaged, and sandwiched between my vertebrae like some drippy egg McFucking muffin. <laughs> so, to, I mean, to hear the doctor talk, you'd think we were talking about some wondrous work of art, I and mean, maybe a Van Gogh from his Arnold's period, and that's when he was institutionalized. <laughs> well, what about a twisted, tortured, he got shield self-portrait, and if my memory serves me correct, he was arrested for pederasty. So I'm thinking that this wondrous work of art should not be relegated to some mere digital disc, that I need a poster of it. Yes, I do. Right. That I can hang on my wall 
next to my cheap reproduction of Monet's water lilies. And, and I can see it now, your eyes will feast upon Monet's Giverney in all its transcendent tranquility, the floating lily pads, the kaleidoscope of colors. And then they will seamlessly saunter across to my frame poster of my leaky desk. Ah, the water motif, continue the fluidity of it all. Wait in the water. Wait in the water. Wait in the water. Got to wait in the water. So I'm thinking like a poster is kind of cool, right? But it's not enough. I need a wallet-sized copy of my kids. <laughs> you know, the kind that you get with your kid's class picture and they come in a packet of eight. I mean, it's not so weird. I mean, people are walking around carrying their photos of their, their child's undulating sonogram, right? Whipping the suckers out to complete strangers who think they've gone AMA from Bellevue, right? They're showing the sonogram of this amorphous blob that is their child, and they're pointing to some speck on the photo, some alien-looking photo, saying, look, you see, it's his penis. Yeah, really, it's his penis. It's a virtual fucking heart on. The kid's gonna be a regular Don Juan. Maybe even get exalted to the status of an Anthony Weiner. So, so why don't you just text the motherfucker to someone out there in the cyber world and see if they want to get down with this mini semblance of virility? Or what about sexting with the mini dick thing? I don't know, but if those suckers can whip that up, I see no reason why I cannot titillate with my wallet-sized copy of my leaky disc. Right? <laughs> So now it's 3.05. And I pop another value, and my leg is still throbbing. And though Monet and Van Gogh and Paul Bunyan have all floated through my pain and flipped your reveries, their visitations have done nothing for the fact that I want to cry from the pain of the jelly in my nerve. But I got the jelly on my nerve blues, and the pain is driving me so insane. I don't even remember my name. And it's 3.05 a.m. So I'm using the bottoms of the palms of my hands, massaging myself deep into the tissue, seeking some relief. But the radiculopathy is my master. The rupture, the extrusion, the leakage, the jelly, the rapturous rupture, extruding the jelly. I need with my hands, I need the pain to get bed. Vamanos hasta la vista, baby. And so at 306, the image of the doctor flows before me like some otherworldly ectoplasm. Just imagine your disc is a jelly donut. What's with the Now jelly imagine donut? squishing down on it, causing some jelly to ooze out. And the doctor is oozing sincerity. And I really do want to like him, but the more I look at him, the more he morphs into some weird, sadistic manager from Dunkin' Donuts. If you're lucky, when the jelly escapes, it squirts in a direction away from the nerve. And then you don't feel anything. You might not even know your disc is ruptured. Really? So what I'm hearing from Dr. Spine, Mr. Duncan D, is that you could spend your entire life with a leaky fucking jelly donut and not even know it? That the reason that I am in such unbearable pain is because of what? Faulty jelly traffic control. And luck. And then my luck, my jelly just happened to eke out the wrong way and take a dump. So, I'm continuing to use the bottoms of the palms of my hand up and down my legs seeking some relief when I realize that the motion that I'm using reminds me of something I learned in Bio 101 called peristalsis. Yeah. I told you, look it up, right? And, and there is a rhythm, a meditative undulation to this movement that is reminiscent of the way food travels down a snake's body. And I am hoping that with this peristaltic technique that I can move the jelly off my nerve. I need to believe this. So at 3.12 in the morning, the Valium, worn off and popping more, my nerve doing the cha-cha-cha across my leg. One, two, cha-cha-cha, one, two, cha-cha-cha. Fourteen days to a little sleep since this has occurred, and seven days to go before my surgery. I mean, you can believe anything, man. You can believe there'll be Israeli, Palestinian.
listening in peace. that's just a bunch of malarkey and malarkey is all I've got. Has my jelly just sitting on my nerve like some hated relative who has come to visit uninvited and plans to stay for an indefinite amount of time? material on my nerve. I mean, the process that with such utter clarity and beauty established that my disc was ruptured, that I was extruding. The reason that Monet and Van Gogh and Paul Bunyan have all floated through my pain inflicted reveries, the reason I would like to go all postal on Dunkin' Donuts. So I find myself thinking about the technician whose job it is for 10 hours a day to stuff people inside coffin-like receptacles with the nonchalance of somebody placing a pair of underwear or socks in a drawer. I mean, to hear we're just a, an assemblage of broken parts, dysfunctional people, just differing in our degrees of misery, and he, he is the image maker, the maker of my water lilies, making me one more ready. He takes the image for my coveted wallet-sized photo, my answer to the sonogram of the amniotic floater with the wiener, so he hands me a hospital gown and points me to my locker. But, but there's no eye contact, there's no connection. I mean, he does not know what a needy person I am, how I need to be seen for my specialness and individuality. So, so I try chatting him up and asking him, but he's gone. So I find myself in this locket area, and I am in such a state of stultifying pain, I'm in the haze. And I, I gotta tell you, I cannot figure out how to use this locker. I mean, something about programming numbers and shit like a hotel safe. And I'm thinking that I'm really feeling stupid and panicking and mortified that I'll have to get this technician to help me out of this situation. But thankfully, I figure it out. But, but then we're on to the dilemma of the hospital gown. I mean, shit, this stuff is tricky. I mean, they don't give you directions with this stuff, right? I mean, do you tie the hospital gowns in the front or the back? I mean, if you tie them in the front and they open, they expose, you expose yourself, you're a flasher. And if you tie them in the back and they open, you're a mooner. And either way, you are a total embarrassment. Right? And suddenly, I, I hear a knock on the door, I swear Excuse I hear a voice. Excuse me, Mr. Jerry. What are you doing in there, jerking off? <laughs> and I'm mortified. So, so I, I take the plunge and tie the strings to the front, right? But he has called me Mr. Jerry, and I feel a connection developing, a symphonic one, right? So I take a seat in the waiting room, and suddenly a woman in her mid-twenties exits from the MRI room, and she is smiling and chatting up this technician and thanking him for 
good MRI experience. And I'm thinking, what the hell could have possibly gone in there to elicit a good MRI experience? But to me, good MRI is the definition of oxymoron. Anyway, um, I look into her eyes, and I realize that she is so high on pills. She must have thought she was some 60s hippy dippy Esalon Institute flotation tank. But as you get through with the fact that you're going to drown, you are transported into a beatific trance where the Dalai Lama plays with your feet. And I am hoping since our relationship has been transformed and my technician is now called me Mr. Jerry, that I too will have my feet rubbed by the Dalai Lama. But I am crushed because all he says is, lie down and don't move. So I'm sliding backwards in this metal cylinder and the pain is coming, and I realize that the position that I've been asked to assume where I have to lie perfectly still, unable to move, is the most painful position I can possibly be in, and is untenable that I can last more than a few minutes like this. But I am a warrior, and I must stick this out, as I only have to come back again tomorrow. So. I am stuffed inside this metal sarcophagus and the pain is coming so hard that I am crying. And, <clears throat> and the, uh, thinking every moment now I will have to get the technician to bail me out and the clanging is intensifying. And to distract myself from the noise and the pain, I join in with the rhythm of the gliding magnets. <laughs> Without Charlie Parker, and then Shema Yisrael, and Roy, and Hey No, and Roy, and Moses, and then Flintstones, meet the Flintstones, all there are my stories, family, and then I don't care about your past, all I want is your love to last. So Jesus Brown, yeah, that break out in a cold sweat, motherfucker, 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 and the technician is paying no attention to what's going on inside the chamber. In fact, he's probably just sitting there munching on a jelly donut. And because he's not communicating with me, I'm convinced he is torturing me. And I've lost the thread of my chanting. And the pain is unbearable. And I scream. And I faint. And Mr. Jerry loses consciousness. soldiers above and they lift us out of this pit filled with our own shit and piss and they refer to the man with the long beard as Lieutenant Brody and they refer to me as Mr. Jerry and there's something really eerie about this is it reminds me of a TV show that I watch. So we are put on a jeep and then suddenly we're on a plane back to America and Brody descends the plane to tremendous fanfare and then he is whisked off in a black limousine. And me, Mr. Jerry, is put on a truck and driven off. And I am screaming, you have the wrong man, that Brody is a terrorist, and that I am the real hero, but they could not break me because I am bipolar. <laughs> and suddenly, I find myself in a polygamous colony in Utah, Utah where I'm being told that my only chance for salvation is to embrace Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And, and, and though the idea of many wives is tantalizing, I have seen the Book of Mormon, and now I am hearing it, and I say thanks, but no thanks. But I was obsessed with escaping and claiming my share of the American dream and protecting my country from this false hero. Right, so I wait till nighttime to all the polygamists start fucking and I make a beeline to the fence and scale it and suddenly I find myself in front of a TV and there is Brody standing next to the Vice President of the United States and I am enraged and I am terrified for my country and he's doing something with his fingers that reminds me of a jazz bass line. Yeah. I hop a train to DC and find 
my way to Brody's house. And when I wait, I like to scatch him out and do day, ba do day, yo ba do do ba ba. And suddenly, Brody emerges from his house with this blonde-haired woman who I recognize as Carrie from the same TV show. And I realize that I'm madly in love with her, and that she knows the meaning of the jazz baseline. So I follow them to a remote cabin in the woods, and I wait. And when I wait, I like to scatter. Suddenly, Brody, I see Brody and, and, and his blonde haired woman, they are embracing in the window, and I can take no more. And like Justin Hoffman in The Graduate, I run to the window and I scream, Elaine, I mean, Carrie, I love you. I love that you are bipolar, because I am bipolar too. Not bipolar one, that's a different diagnosis. <laughs> Suddenly I am moving and I'm being jolted from this dream and let out of the internment of my MRI. And as my head emerges from the chamber, I see my torturous face and he has a sadistic smile on it. And he says, Mr. Jerry, it is over. So it's now 325. And I pop another dalliant, and my leg is still throbbing. And I'm still captive to the jelly on my nerve. So I'm thinking, I need to figure out what this torture of this vertebral disc is made of, what is wreaking such havoc on my life. So I take out my computer, and I Google, <coughs> what the fuck is a vertebral disc made of? And the computer is having a freak out with the fuck part, and it's it is generating all kinds of porn sites. You know, tells you where the computer is lying at. And, and like, you know, tits and ass and bestiality. And this one is really interesting, sex with frisbees or other dislike objects. And I am thinking that maybe with my surgery, I should pursue this option because that is the ultimate, ultimate frisbee experience. So I take the fuck out of my search and voila, a veritable cornucopia of options appear before me. And I find out that the nucleus pulposus is at the center of the jelly conspiracy. And it is the water-rich gelatinous material that supports the brunt of the burden on the spine. When you stand in an upright position, the reason I cannot walk six steps, the reason I cannot stand up straight on two feet to pee, right? And, and it tells me that this nucleus pulposus is my inner jello. Mm. So perhaps I should meditate on this jello. So like a yogi, I focus in on my inner jello and all looking for a sign and all that comes up is you is just an unlucky motherfucking schmuck who gets his orders from something called smuckers. So dejected, I'm about to leave the site when I see what is jelly made of. Mm. So curiosity, my demon, I decide to click on this site in case I get called to be a contestant on Jeopardy. <laughs> where I have to answer questions in the category of favorite jams. <laughs> yes, play Jeopardy! Come on. Okay, double Jeopardy time. All right, here we go. Uh, Mr. Jerry, it is your, your turn. Thank you, Alec. What will you choose? I will choose favorite jams for 1,000. You got it. This organization claims it gets its jelly from the collagen of the aliens that inhabited this earth 13 trillion years ago, and all jelly's production is supervised by the holy triumvirate of Travolta, Cruz, and Will Smith. Uh, Alec, is that Scientology? That is correct, Mr. Jerry. You are now in the lead. Yes. What will your next choice be? I will choose a bear. Jeopardy in the middle of the night, so what, what does that have to say about me? Anyway, you know, I'm thinking that sometimes when I'm in bearable pain, my like music is a real healer, so I think I need a song just about now. And for some reason, strange as it may be, I'm thinking about this musical, old time musical called Annie 
gets her gun. And I gotta tell you, I'm not thinking about the any part. I'm thinking about the gun part. Because sometimes the pain is so bad, I think I should just shoot myself. But I think I'll go for a song instead. Except the jelly they put on me is not cool. It felt like bezel bumps slithering all around me. So then we're on to the depositing of the urine sample, right? Simply peeing in a cup. But there is a dilemma with a capital D that spells trouble, and I cannot stand up straight on two feet to pee, and I have no experience <coughs> peeing while sitting. So I think maybe I should stand on one foot. Well, I don't think that would go so well. So to squat or not to squat, that is the question. And I'm looking at this thing going like, how the hell do women do this? I mean, look, it's so small, and you're not even looking at the thing when you're paying into it. I mean, is there some kind of, I don't know, like training video or target <laughs> practice where you get three shots for a dollar so you can learn how to stem the tide so you don't create a total disaster? Well, anyway, despite my concern and lack of experience in this area, I decide to go for the squatting thing. And besides a little overflow, it goes well. And I gotta tell you, I'm really proud of my sample. Yes, I'm so proud I forget to place it in its proper receptacle, and I'm walking around the corridor showing it to random people. <laughs> Think, work of art. Monet is water lilies, the gelatinous material on my nerve, and the fluidity of it all. And the nurse is looking at me in a concerned way, and she says, What kind of weirdo are you showing off your urine sample? Uh, she does not understand, she does not know what I've done, how I've crossed over with this squatting thing. And so, uh, she's so freak. Uh, the nurse, who already thinks I have a few screws loose, she grabs for the sample. And I refuse to relinquish it. We are getting into a tug of war in the middle of the corridor. And she is so freaked out that finally I decide to relinquish my chair sample before we get into some weird, perverted version of WWF Smackdown right in the middle of the corridor. And a trip to Bellevue, a real possibility. But I'm not crazy. Nah. I'm just a little bit twisted. Right. My animals told me that I was right out of my head the way he described it. He said I'd be dead or dead then. My, I didn't listen to his jive. I knew all the wrong. He was all wrong. And I knew that he thought I was crazy, but not. No, 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 I'm just twisted, man. 
So, I'm thinking that this pre-op sucker is over, right? But no, 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 no. Now I have to take a test for my lung capacity. I don't really know what that's about. I don't really care. Just want out of here. I mean, I know I'm not a smoker, but anyway. So, check this out. This nurse gives me a plastic tube that's connected to a little computer screen, and inside the screen is a fireman holding a hose and a fire raging next to him. <laughs> And she instructs me to place my mouth on the tube below as hard as I can, forcing the, the water to come out of the fireman's hose and douse the flames. <laughs> so my first attempt at this is pathetically piddly and only a little tinkle comes out. And so the nurse is looking at me in a way that conveys... You're pathetic. I wouldn't even meet you at a Chuck E. Cheese for a date. And I am ramped up in my panic and heat essence, trying to figure out what I have what I have to do to get this cartoon fireman to put up this fire, and what the hell does any of this have to do with the surgery that's going to remove the jelly from my nerve? So, she tells me to try again. Okay, so, I, <clears throat> this time I try to be clever, and I channel my inner Popeye when he blows his pipe and pops his can of spinach. Oh! And this time, the intake on the inhale is so poor that nothing comes out of the hose. And I am fucked in doom, and my last chance at being the fireman hero is spent. And suddenly, I'm wishing that I had not relinquished my cherished urine sample, as that would have definitely doused the flames and freaked out the fireman who would have never played this idiotic game again. So I think I'm going to get to go home, but no, I have to take another test for my heart. So I get through that test, think this is it, right? But then I find out that I have a wimpy ventricle. What the fuck is a wimpy ventricle? I mean, come on, what is your like, ventricle just implode? Like that, I mean, what is it? So anyway, I find out that this wimpy ventricle is going to prevent me from getting my surgery unless I have a stress test. And I'm looking at the doctor saying, dude, you don't understand. I can ride a bike 10 miles in 32 minutes, keeping my heart rate at 150. If I needed, if I had a problem with my heart, I would be dead already. That's all fine and dandy, Mr. Lance Armstrong, but they'll cancel your surgery unless you have a stress test that proves your heart is okay. Up to you. So, off to the cardiologist I go, thinking that maybe I just have a coronary on the way, and that would certainly solve the problem of the jelly on my nerve. So I'm sitting in the cardiologist's office, and it dawns on me that when you take a stress test, you have to run on a treadmill. And I cannot walk six steps. How the hell am I gonna run on a motherfucking treadmill? And I, I try explaining this to the nurse, and she says, We'll do some kind of modified test for you. And I'm like, you don't understand. I can't walk six steps. Now, do you have a bike? Because despite all my pain, I can ride a bike without any problem. Don't do bikes. What do you mean you don't do bikes? That's the way it is. Oh. Sorry. So I am lying on this table, being hooked up like some bionic man, staring in abject terror at the treadmill wondering what a modified stress test could possibly be. And the doctor joins us. Just try. So, I'm walking very slowly towards the treadmill, and I think that this must be Bezelbub's doing. It's a plot. And that I'm so fearful of the pain that's going to be inflicted upon me that for a moment, in a moment of weakness, I think maybe I shouldn't do this. I realize that I am a warrior, and I will not surrender, and I'm going to get on that treadmill. So, so they instruct me to stand erect and keep my arms on the side bars. But I can't do that. Standing up straight is the most painful thing that I can possibly do. What is wrong with these people? So, in a moment of genius, I decide that perhaps I can run on the tr I can run a treadmill in the same position that I ride a bike, because when I ride a bike, I don't have any pain. So despite what they say, I lean in like a jockey, and I grab the front bars, and I start moving, 
and they are Stand screaming at me. Stand up and I'm without any pain. Put your hands on the sidebar. Put your hands on the sidebar. What you're doing is dangerous. Dangerous, my ass. What is dangerous is what you are telling me to do. So I pick up the, the pace and like a jockey, leaning into my right. And I'm the derby. I'm using a visible whip. Ha! Ha! I propel myself forward. And I'm going from 130 to 135 to 140 to 145. And I am there. And I have to do this for two minutes. And to spike it, I pick up the pace. And I go to 150. Finally, we are speechless. So I lit off the treadmill to find out about Wimpy Venture. Your heart is healthy. I told you so. Next time, get a freaking bike. And so I walk out of the office all triumphantly, but it's only a matter of a few steps before the pain returns front and center. But I gotta tell you that when I was on that treadmill, I really believed that the jelly was gone, that it was sucked into some deep hole in the interior of my body, and that I was cured. Wait, can you blame me? Oh. I hate treadmills. And when I go into a gym and I see a treadmill, I get hives. I think it's time for another song, because I need to reestablish my equilibrium. So I have this little contra contraption that I built, it's a little washboard. And I use these thimbles on my fingers to, uh, to play it. It's kind of amusing. Um, so, I'm gonna do a little song, it's an old standard, called uh, Pennies from Heaven. But I'm gonna hell it up a little bit. Every time we bring you away, jelly from hell. Drop containers, jelly from hell. You'll find your misfortune falling all over town. Just make sure your umbrella ain't upside down. Save it for a pocket full of sunshine and flowers. If you want the things you love, you don't want showers. When it thunders, get your ass under a tree. Call us jelly from heaven and jelly from hell. Jelly from hell, yeah. Jelly from hell will get you surgery. therapist seeing my very first patient and, and frankly I'm shitting in my pants and, and uh, I have a hard time introducing myself to this person I I, um, I say uh, hello Jasmine uh, I'm your new, new, new therapist Jerry Finkelstein Finkelstein what kind of name is that oh Jasmine honey that is a Jewish name isn't that right Jerry and suddenly we are on to the Jewish question I mean, let's face it, are we ever off the Jewish question, right? <laughs> so, I turn to find the voice, and then it really starts to unravel, as there is Jasmine's mother looking at me the way any man would want a woman to look at him, but not when they are their child's therapist. She has what 
they call crazy eyes. And these crazy eyes are locked in on me like a heat-seeking missile, and I cannot break free. And she is smiling at me, and I'm thinking, oh my god, I'm so fucked. And without changing her stare, she introduces herself. Hi, I'm Elaine, and you are our Jewish doctor, Jerry Finkelstein. And before I can say anything, she says, Shall we go into the office for our session? And I say, Shall we go into the bedroom for our session? Yeah, yeah, she say what? Isn't it time for our session to begin? Yeah, okay, yeah. So we, we, we enter into the office and Jasmine sits on one side of the <clears throat> desk and Elaine sits on the other, and I am stuck in the middle between the two of them, and they are looking at each other in a disturbingly knowing way, and it dawns upon me that I've come across the central problem in this girl's life, that the two of them emerge, except at this juncture, she loves me, and I just want to go join a monastery. So, somehow, I make it through the 45 minutes of the session, I schedule an appointment for the following week, that is the definition of masochism. And then, I can't remember a thing, and all I can write in my note is, help! And I'm feeling it kind of crazy and an intense psychic pain. And now that I think of it, this psychic pain reminds me of my current nerve pain. It's just nerve fibers running in different directions. Yes. So all week long, <coughs> Elaine inhabits my mind like an erotic tick. Every kiss, every hug, God seems to act like a drug. She's getting to be a habit with me, yeah. So this time when I enter the waiting room, once again, Elaine is dressed to kill, this time sporting a leopard leotard. Am I shocked? No, but am I turned on? Yeah. But it's not what she is wearing that makes me cast out loud, it's what she is wearing around her. I mean, she's wearing an eight-foot snake wrapped around her like a necklace. And Jasmine is sitting across from her and her eyes are sparkling like fireflies and she cannot sit still. Jerry, meet Alex, Jasmine's snake and best friend. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a fucking Fellini movie. Remember last week, you said that I should bring in things that were important to me as that would help you get to know me? Yes, I did say that, didn't I? And I'm thinking, if I ever have another session, I will never ask that question. <laughs> so, and not knowing how to greet a snake, never having done that before, I do a little bow to Alex. Shall we go into the office for our session? And I hear. Shall we go into the S and M chamber for our session? <laughs> sure, follow me. So, as we're walking down the corridor, I notice that Jasmine has a lunchbox in one hand and she has a cardboard container in the other hand that she's holding by a handle, right? And what this session will be like will be like no other I will ever have. And if we get to the, to the office, we assume the same positions as the week before. Jasmine on one side, Elaine with a snake draped around her on the other, and me stuck in the middle. I mean, so I do the therapist thing, and I ask her about her snake, and I say, why did you get such a big one? Well, I wanted a smaller one, but Mommy wanted a big one. Oh, what a surprise. Yes. And as if it could get no more bizarre, I ask her what she has in her cardboard container. It's a mouse, a live mouse. You're going to see Alex eat his lunch. Isn't that exciting? Yeah, exciting. So, Elaine, she unfurls the snake from her neck and lays it down across the table and the, the snake extends its body, and it picks up its head and sticks out its tongue. Lunch time. And Jasmine picks the mouse out of the box, and she holds it up, and the mouse would definitely shit in his pants if he were any. And she places it in the snake's mouth. And together, the three of us are mesmerized as we watch the, the mouse go down the snake's body. And it dawns on me that I am watching peristalsis in action. The very same motion I've been using to try to move the jelly off my nerve. And perhaps this is why I'm dreaming this at 4 a.m. The pain subsiding from the ice and the massage, the valley moving me towards unconsciousness. And I'm fainting and my lids are closing and I'm being given a reprieve from the pain. And the next time I see the clock, 
It is 401. So I wake up from the surgery, groggy from the anesthesia, but I feel no pain. I wiggle my left leg, I feel no pain. I lie on my jelly side, I feel no pain. I look left, right, center every single way to see if Beelzebub is there, tantalizing me, showing me what it would be like to be pain free. But there is no evidence of Beelzebub, and for now the surgeon has vanquished him as he has vanquished the jelly off my nerve. So it's not until a couple hours later, right, that I, in my hospital, that I take the true first test, right? So I stand up, connected to my hospital pole, and bags of drippy fluids, think fluidity of it all. And I take my first step, and then another, and then another, and I am walking pain-free. And I'm so giddy with delight that I ask a nurse on the corridor if she wants to dance, and she says, salsa or tango? It's only a matter of time before I'll be able to crank up James Brown and do the boogaloo So, so before you leave the hospital, right, you gotta pee. You just gotta do it while you're the hospital. So, I'm feeling it. So, take one step towards the bathroom, pain free, and suddenly I'm having what Yogi Berra calls a deja vu experience all over again. The dilemma with a capital P that spells trouble, despite my progress. I'm a little bit concerned I won't be able to stand up on two feet to pee. So I think maybe I'll stand on one foot, or maybe I'll squat. But no, I decide to go for it. And lo and behold, I am peeing on two feet, yes. And I feel the exhilaration of Jimmy Stewart in Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life, when in a moment of desperation, he discovers Susu's pedals and realizes he has his old life back. And peeing has never been so gratifying. It has risen to the level of a transcendent experience. And he tells me that the size of my rupture was actually twice the size that it was shown in the original MRI. And that the surgery took longer and there was more jelly to remove. And he could not believe I could walk one step and he could only imagine the unbearable pain that I must have been in. And then he tells me that I was lucky that I did not incur permanent nerve damage. So he tells me no bending, lifting, and twisting for six weeks and we make a two-week follow-up appointment, and he shakes my hand and dismisses me from the hospital. I mean, it's pretty impressive, right? I mean, you go into the hospital in the morning for a spine surgery, and then you walk out on your own two feet at night. Seems more people should believe in science, don't you think? <laughs> image of my massive rupture from the surgery. And I say, Doc, show me the jelly. And I'm in awe of it. And there is a, a disturbing beauty in its devastation. And I am looking at the rupture, the extrusion, the leakage, the jelly, the rapturous rupture extruding the jelly, and the ridiculopathy of it all. And thinking how wonderful this new image will look on my wall next to Monet's Watermelons and 
Bobby, what you gonna play? I don't know, James, but whatever it is, it's got to be funky. Hit it. Yeah.